As usual, top of the league is, um, it takes effective leadership. And it's an absolute delight, Sil, to get you here. Uh, we've been trying to get Sil to join us for many a long year, and she's taken time out of her diary, which I know is precious to you. Um, I've always admired the work that you've done through various companies. You've now been, uh, to pick up on Martin's theme, for the last six years, Chief Marketing and Innovation Officer at Diageo. And we're really thrilled to have you here. Um, and we're going to wander through a few subjects here um, in the time remaining. But let's start with leadership. Uh, and I think, as we know, marketing's a we thing, not a me thing. It and in is. order to extract the we thing, you have to be a great leader. Uh, tell us about your leadership style. Oh, simple as question to start. Um, and I don't even have a Portugal shirt or anything else to warm up the audience. I thought that was brilliant, Jeff. I don't know if he's still yeah. here, but it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I guess I start by rooting myself in uh, our company strategy and our purpose. Now, the conversations that we've been having about creativity and the fact that that seems to have slipped down our agenda and we're going to bring it back is really important. But in the boardroom and in our executive I think you have to speak the language of growth. So you root yourself in that. You understand the company strategy. And in, in particular, I'm known for leading for Diageo. And that goes a long way. When people trust that you're leading for the company, not your own agenda, not even the marketing agenda, they listen. You have more credibility. And I think that's made an enormous difference that, uh, that my team leads that way. Um, because we don't look like the people who are sort of putting our arms around our budget and protecting it. In, in terms of purpose, our company purpose is to celebrate life every day, everywhere. We don't make a big thing of that externally. Um, it's not an employer brand thing. It's not, we're not a consumer brand as Diageo because honestly, we know that you don't want to know that you, the brands that I hope many of you love, Guinness, Smirnoff, Tanqueray, Johnny Walker, most of the malts in the world, all come from us. Um, so we leave it as this is what drives us internally. And talking about our purpose as celebrate life every day, everywhere, is, you know, it doesn't mean just raising a glass, though we don't mind if you do. It does mean um, that we want to make a difference everywhere we operate. And really, that's my personal purpose. So people say, if you cut Sil, she bleeds Diageo. Yeah. Uh, when I realized that they were so closely aligned, I like, kept it a secret. I didn't want to talk about it, because it sounds really naff to say, my company purpose is my personal purpose. Uh, but it is. So that makes a difference. And, and I guess, if I listen to the way the team describes it, they would say, I'm intensely focused on culture, results, and uh, being both supportive and demanding. Now, in, so they would never know if I'm going to ask them a question, how are you feeling today? What's happening? Let's explore your leadership. Or what were the numbers this week? How are we doing? Where are we going in three years? Um, but here's the truth. The truth is, and when it comes to people and results, I actually only care about people. Um, I care about our consumers. I was trained to be a psychologist or a social worker, and so that's what I really care about. But if you don't engender the results, you can't create an atmosphere in which people thrive. So there was a question yesterday, should marketing still sell? And I say, hell yeah. Because if we don't sell, how are we going to contribute to our communities? How are we going to give jobs? So that's what really matters. And, and I think that this intensely supportive and intensely demanding thing is, is an unusual combination. Um, you know, so yeah, I have high standards, and people, people know that. But I think when, when people feel like I'm there for them, and people feel like they're not going to be surprised, you know, there's nothing unsaid in our relationship. I'm going to say what I feel. I'm going to say it in a way that I think serves them. If I believe my net promoter scores, which is the only external measure I yeah. have of it, it's a pretty good combination. So 
I have a lot to learn, but that's how I'd describe it. And, and tell us a little bit about what we were talking about yesterday. I mean, you, you took the company through a remarkable phase of change and leading through change when you're really rebuilding a marketing organization yeah. is probably the toughest thing to do. How was that and what did you do? Wow, uh, it was. Small question. It's been, no, it's been a very interesting uh, time. I guess if I, if I look at it over the lifespan of my career and, and you always get advice, what advice would you give your younger self? I'd say you can be so much more than you think you can be. And people never quite believe who don't know me that I never wanted the next job. Uh, people who know me well know that's absolutely true. And there was always a reason when I was offered the next job. Um, it usually went, I'm pregnant, I just had a kid, I'm pregnant again, I just had a kid, um, I won't move, my family's the most important, and all of that is true. But having studied gender equality pretty intensely, I now understand that a lot of the reason that I didn't step up into these roles was that I didn't think I could do it. And, um, you know, uh, now what I say to people is do it, please do it, because you only know how to stretch yourself by doing it, those things you don't think you can do and learning that you can do them. The other thing for many people, and this is a, a personal topic that hasn't been discussed uh, that much, but um, let me just do a temperature check. Anybody have an inner critic in their head, a voice? Hands up. In a critic in your in head. In a critic. I'm really curious to know if those that don't put their hands up either don't know what I'm talking about or are lying. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about a person because it may not apply to everybody. But, but listen, I've learned to tune out the inner critic when it matters. So if I were to listen to myself right now, if I give you an in the moment example, here's what I sound like. And the reason that I have my iPad to keep me on track because I think I sound like Oh, I'm rambling. I'm not making sense. Oh, they're on their phone over there. I don't think they're tweeting. They're bored out of their mind. My God, I'm boring them and they're going to leave soon. <laughs> That's what it feels in my head. Um, and I've literally learned to tune that out because if I don't, I'm just going to be even more nervous and that doesn't serve you. And I care deeply about making this a session that hopefully you'll get something out of. If I use a bigger example, you're talking about the tough times. I am really proud that Diageo has increased its results year on year. Um, since we became a new executive team, I became CMO. Um, and I'm incredibly proud that in the past uh, half, our results in a rather low growth industry were six on the revenue line and 11 on the bottom line, and that's damn good. But the first two years, were very difficult. And if I measured myself by those results, I just would go down as the worst CMO in Diageo's history. Um, and at the time, I just couldn't listen to that because, and, and I couldn't even think it, right? Because if I thought it, again, everybody knows I'm not very good at hiding my emotions. So I'm not talking about go around, lead with pride. I literally couldn't think it because it would show. So, and, and if I thought it, it would take time, it would drain my energy and it would take time from the job at hand, which is transforming our organization, turning around our brands. And if I did that, I would be letting down this company that I love. I'd be letting down our shareholders. I'd be letting down our people and our consumers. So turn off that inner critic. It doesn't serve you really. Yes, there's some useful feedback, but we operate so much better from our strengths. Yeah, I mean, I, can we dive into this a little bit? <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I, I'm fascinated by this because, you know, we, we talk a lot about the need to have um, healthy paranoia. Um, unhealthy paranoia is bad. And, and actually, I, I don't know, most of the people I know well have self-doubt. This is not something that you'd usually confess around a leadership table, but it's a healthy thing to do. How, how have you dealt with turning off the voice? How did you talk to your boss about that? How, how have you managed through? What can we all learn from you? Because there's a lot to learn. I think, I mean, one of the reasons I'm happy to put this topic into the room is I think the more we talk about it, the more it becomes okay. And, and uh, you know, those things that you repress, if you are not feeling like you can be your authentic self at work, 
I think it stifles performance. Yeah. It takes a lot of energy to put on that, put on that charade. Um, so I think it belongs out there. Um, and I think, I, I'm not sure if it's right. I mean, uh, to operate from paranoia. Uh, one of my uh, executive coaches, my, well, I haven't had, I've only had one, she's amazing, uh, Martha Graham, she put it to me this way. She said, Syl, when are you at your best? When you are free and in the flow, which is how I am with my family, or when you're uptight and overprepared? And the answer is free. So this is a very open conversation um, in Diageo. This is a conversation we would have at the, exec in, at the exec table. And our leadership training engenders us standing up in front of a couple hundred people and telling our story. And I remember once I was talking about something and I was actually reflecting back, I was summing up the session, I was reflecting back on something that other people in the audience had said. And I felt very emotional about it. And I'm not good, you might have guessed, I'm not really good at showing the emotion uh, in my voice. It's always like, oh, I'm very confident, I know everything, I'm just fine. That's the voice, right? That's not the emotion. So I cry a lot. And I was on stage and I started to cry and I shut my eyes and said, beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> and, and I opened them, and people were on their feet clapping. I mean, I was mortified, but they were on their feet clapping. And I went off, and I said to the person that you should be able to trust the most in the world, my assistant, and uh, I said, why are they clapping? That was so humiliating. And she said, it was human, and wouldn't you? So I think this is, this is a great place companies could be this conversation, because then I know, if you tell me what you're worried about, if you tell me what you're afraid of, I can help you. I'm yeah. a very good coach. I can we do that now? You. Sure. <laughs> no, 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 I, no, I also think you know, one of the things you've talked about, uh, and I've followed you a lot on this, is you're very passionate about diversity. I am. Uh, diversity in the workplace, and some of the initiatives you've taken, uh, people in Portugal probably won't know about. So, so can we take this a little bit into the diversity space and tell us what you've been championing? Oh, my favorite space. Um, listen, we've talked a lot this week about our collective power. <coughs> and if you think about it, culture, society, has been shaped through the millennia by storytelling. And what is all of our content? Our content is storytelling backed by trillions of dollars. And boy, that is going to shape society. So what we show, honestly, what we in this room show shapes who people think they can be. And that matters. So when we sh uh, take shortcuts and we show content that is stereotyped, I think that's what we're going to get back. We're going to get an unrealistic expectation. Um, and there's all kinds of stereotypes that we should be defeating, but I, I believe in having a focus at first. And um, so I was very, very impressed and shaken a bit hearing the stats at Cannes. Um, you know, when Keith and Unilever and the Unstereotype Alliance started talking about the fact that they hadn't moved Mark Pritchard and the Gina Davis Institute you know, a study of 10,000 ads, and we have not made progress in a decade, despite all the talk. That really shook me to the core. So we immediately joined, we immediately joined the Unstereotype Alliance, but we also went back and looked at our own advertising and said, how are we doing? And the answer was not good enough. So I'd say we, we, we were a bit behind, but I'm very proud of how quickly we moved to address it. So we, uh, you know, we're very good at internal development. We're very good at training. We developed within six months the training, rolled it out to 1,200 marketers and all, of all of our agencies. We signed up to free the bid, and we are happily sharing our content, our stories, and happily talking about where we get it right and where we get it wrong externally. I, I know I, I've heard Ivan talk about this, and I, I think he was slightly concerned that you were giving everybody a competitive advantage that you built for Diageo. Yes. I mean, how did you manage that dialogue? Because I think it's wonderful that you share it, by the way, and really important that people see the work you've done. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an open... Listen, it was a really open conversation. I think 
that our competitive advantage is really in our creative capabilities and our ability to measure where, whether it's working and to keep experimenting. And I think that's what our competition needs to uh, keep up with. And in this case, the conversation we had is, I think that the, um, the benefits of sharing it far outweigh the risks, and Ivan does too. I mean, he is absolutely Great. behind this. Because courage is contagious, right? And what I wanted people to see is, do we have all the answers? No. But were we willing to put our heads above the parapet and declare a position? Yes. And I really invite everybody to join us and the other companies in doing that. And we know we're going to be criticized. I guarantee you, someplace in our Diageo world, somebody will be making a piece of content that doesn't live up to the standard we set. And I hope people see us at the learning organization that we are when that happens. But we're going to keep going, we're going to keep learning, and I'd encourage everyone to join us. Fantastic. And, and I know you wrote to your agencies. I did. Asking them for their diversity stats. Uh, what I don't know is what they responded. You know, they, they, they were great. Um, people were really forthcoming in sharing. Uh, the, the numbers were good. Um, I was talking to the drum about this today, and I don't know if it's a like-for-like like measure, but it looks like our agencies are a bit better than the averages, uh, a lot better from the averages, and that's not surprising given what we look for. So 40% of the uh, agency leader, 47% of the agency leadership front are women. Of the ones that we surveyed, we're happy about that. 45% of our marketing leadership at Diageo are women. 40% of our executive, which is pretty darn good for a uh, large FTSE company. Um, so that's, that's critical. Creative leadership, which in the UK stands at 12%, in our sample was 39%. But when you cut it down to the top agencies, it's 24%. And that's not good enough. So that dialogue will continue. But in the meantime, what I was listening for was to have real empathy and understand from the agencies what are their issues. And one of the things we heard was, we lose women at really critical times in their lives, times when they need to become carers of children or parents. And so we started working with a fantastic organization called Creative Equals. Yeah. And they do terrific work. And they um, were putting together a returners scheme, which we agreed to sponsor. And it provided training for really talented women, 50 really talented women. And uh, we gave them two briefs. And I'm not talking small little brands that we might have you know, in Venezuela somewhere. I'm talking. Bailey's and Guinness. And uh, what a day it was for the members of my team who attended. They said there were tears, people were excited. And one of the reasons I have my trusty iPad here is um, you had mentioned you wanted to talk about this. And I, I want to share what uh, I wrote to uh, one of the planners who was there. And I said, how did it go? How was the work? Um, what did you hear? And, and here's what she said back from this day of listening. We were listening to the responses to the brief. It was a flood of creativity, and our brands were lucky to have it unleashed on our issues. We saw ideas on both Bailey's and Guinness that lifted and delighted us. We got unexpected ideas powerfully and simply expressed with personality and flair. Wow. Now, how many creative uh, reviews do you go into, or that, that is the feedback, and it's so universal, and this is first time out of the box, and I say, well done to these women. Quite right, too. Uh, the, um, another theme here, let's talk a little bit about how you build a team. So, for instance, this role, when I took this role, first time in my management career that I didn't have a single uh, w female direct report. They were all men. Uh, but I did have a target, and the target was you've got to have 35% by 2020. Now I have 50-50 because -50 that's what the population is. That's the way it should be, and I just did that. Because so yes. you, 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 you have to do things, not talk about them, not have targets. How, how have you managed that? How do you help people progress? So I, you know, I'm proud of the company I work for because we're fantastic supporting people when they need time off, when they go off to have children, 
we ease them back in and, yes. and that, it, that's a real cultural advantage because we think culture is a competitive advantage if you build it well and, and talent of course is the war that we all need to win how how have you been doing that so uh Everything you just said is right, and we do those things too. Um, a few things I would add is it varies by country, whether it's legal to do this, and we operate in 180 countries, so we have to think about it. Um, but we, we think a lot about and ask for where it's legal, 50-50 um, uh, lists when we're externally recruiting. Um, we, I think, are good on the HR policy front, uh, progr particularly progressive in the U.S. We've just instituted equal uh, parental leave, so men and women taking off the same amount of time. And guess what? That changes the conversation from women having babies to people having children. And I think that is <laughs> fantastic. I, listen, I, can, I can't see the questions, but on behalf of the audience, I feel obliged to ask you whether you're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> we are always hiring. Uh, go on to Diageo.com. The one thing not to do is please don't email me. Um, I get, and please don't pitch me um, on email. I get like 300 emails a day. And I have this really funny perspective with agencies approaching me on, on email. And I know we have a mostly client audience, but let me ask if you feel this way too. It's like, how archaic is that, that someone thinks an email is going to get uh, you business? Um, but please, if you're interested in our amazing company, because that really is the other thing, is, you know, Ivan, uh, who is named um, by women in business in the community, one of their champions, management today, one of the leaders of change, you know what I think his issue is? I don't think he sees, I don't think he sees color, sexual, I don't think he sees women, gender, he doesn't see it. Yeah. He just is looking for the best talent and wanting to do the right thing and he creates the environment and we are right there, right there with him. And do, do you measure, we call it employee engagement, you know, there are all sorts yes. of things. Do you measure it? How, yes. What are the scores on the door? They are off the charts. Now, it, uh, give, me giving you a number uh, won't make any sense, but we use the IBM, uh, we've just switched suppliers, but we use the IBM stats and we are off the charts. And we know this is a big plank, but also the care that you have for people, um, the, the line management responsibilities, which I look at intensely, right? How are you coaching your people? Are your people free? The things that we talked about before, I look at those very intensely. And when people know you're looking at it, they, they tend they to really attention. hone their line management skills. And then you create that ripple effect. Yeah, we always inspect what we expect. Exactly. Um, <laughs> to, to say it like that. A couple of conscious of time here. Can I just go back to some partnership issues and agencies? I know you and I have talked before, you, you have very low tolerance for people who whinge about <laughs> either marketing or agencies, but you know, how, and I, I feel badly for agencies who take the blame of a lot of our collective woes. How, how are you feeling about agencies? What would you like to share with the room? You know, I'm always surprised when clients complain about agencies. Because when I see something going wrong with one of our agencies, my first thought is, what are we doing wrong? Exactly. Because we are at least half the equation. So, you know, how would it sound? Let's see. I really hate the way Diageo goes about this. I really think that I'm a bad leader. I mean, I'm complaining about myself. There's, there's so much that we need to get in order. So the, the way I talk to our agencies about it, and I encourage my team to, is let's be really honest about what our issues are. Um, and I encourage our agencies to speak up and, uh, and, and then to have us really listen, 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 listen. Now, what I'm surprised at is, is uh, what I talk to our agencies a lot about is how um, reluctant agencies are to do that. Because what they think is going to happen is lower down the chain with the client they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, there will be reprisals. And can I just say to all agencies out there, trust that we are not morons. You know, we, <laughs> we are not going to go to, you know, uh, me, me and my senior team are not going to go um, to the brand team and say, such and such an agency thinks you have a bad brief, complains about you, and, you know, thinks you have no creative judgment. 
No, we're just going to insert ourselves into the conversation at the right time. We're going to ask to see that brief. It's going to make a difference. But agencies need to be brave enough to come forward. And we're doing all kinds of things internally because we want to be the best client we can possibly be because that's how you get great work. Yeah, no, you and me both. And I think, you know, one of the things we do... Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You know, one of the things we do is we have a, I'm going to call him a coach. He's a trained psychologist. I get him to go talk to the agencies, you know, what's going on, put the truth on the table, do the other Brilliant. thing. And we score on the door. Actually, it's so easy to see incremental improvement as long as there's trust on trust. the table. So can we talk a little bit about trust? Another great theme we've heard here. I know we're going off script here, but you didn't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, that's we can fine. Go script. Tell me how you built trust, trust around the executive committee, trust in your team. Trust with your people, because you can feel the energy that comes yeah. from the agio. I mean, the obvious, you know, promises made, promises kept is true. Um, I think, I, I think authenticity is an, over, an overused word, but I, I think it does lay at the core of trust um, in, in terms of people saying what's on their mind. And I think if you listen, so, so for example, the way I run my team, lots of teams write manifestos um, about who they're going to be, how they're going to operate. And um, we have a set of company values, um, like every company does. I think they are meaningful. So when we look at ourselves as a team, we don't try to rewrite those values. Those are our values. We don't try to rewrite our company ambition. That's what it says. But teams, I think it's good for a team to engage with, how do we want to operate as a team? And we could have said 100 things. And we came down to two, which is 10 out of 10 relationships, meaning we actually relate, we, we actually rate our relationships with each other. That's a very honest conversation. And when it's not 10 out of 10, we say, what are we going to do to take it there? And then the, sem the, the second really simple thing, nothing unsaid. There, you know, I run meetings where um, the only way you really get in trouble, you don't get in trouble for saying, you know, I think this is a crappy conversation and you're totally wrong and still, you know, uh, I'm bored, I'm not really tuning into this, I'm looking at my email, why have you put together this? You don't get in any trouble for that. You get in a lot of trouble if you walk out of the room and go, well, that sucked. Yeah. Uh, you know, just say it in the room. And a lot of times people think these conversations need to happen behind closed doors. But, but the secret is a team that can have this kind of conversation openly is a team that can trust that you can do that and nothing bad will happen. Yeah. And that builds trust. Yeah, we, we do that in our exec and I do that with my leadership team. Wonderful. Uh, and coming to the close here, it's been great to spend time with you here. You know, what have your highlights been in these last couple of days? What would you say to the WFA about your experience here? You know, it's gonna, it's gonna sound a bit sycophantic, and we know each other well enough to know that uh, I don't say anything I don't mean. Um, but I really, really think the WFA is on to something. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's seen the CMO um, charter. Not yet. It is, honestly, what it does is it describes the five challenges facing CMOs, and it's like, Somebody reached into my brain and put on a piece of paper what I'm worried about, optimizing organizations, the future of uh, advertising. I won't go through it all, I'll leave that to you, but the things that were on my mind, and when I, and that's what we've been discussing on the whole, but, uh, uh, you know, plus putting creativity right back at the top of the agenda. But what was in the middle uh, gave me heart, because honestly, when I looked at those five things, I realized why CMOs, many CMOs are very stressed. Now, I'm not very stressed. I'm too old to be stressed. But many CMOs are very stressed. And it's because these are five big things. And what gave me heart was the fact that in the middle of it all, it's people-centric. And I'm sure you're going to define that in different ways. But to me, what it means is it's down to us to solve these problems. It's in our hands. and we're not alone. And I think the WFA is doing a wonderful job of bringing us together to solve these issues. And I would encourage us to continue 
to work together, to share our problems, to have the honest conversation, to collaborate with other um, industry bodies, but let, let's make sure the dialogue about what we do is as optimistic and positive and as purposeful as it can possibly wow. be. And what a wonderful note to end on. And ladies and gentlemen, thank one of the world's great CMOs. Thank you. Thank you.